A real pleasure. Uh, this is this is fun. The last time uh, we got to hang out was in Estes Park, um, and that was a real treat for me. Getting to like, I felt like walking into you know a uh, modest cathedral, but that was a chance to kind of um, see this converted garage that is quite a uh, remarkable little climbing gym. Not that little uh, climbing gym, um, and. Tommy's book had just come out, The Push. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, if you have not read The Push, I'm going to say right now, in case I forget later, read The Push. Um, and you'll see why I said what I said uh, in my introduction here. Um, but anyway, so it's very fun to be kind of doing a round two here um, a couple years later. Um, I figured maybe what we would do in terms of getting into this is um, You've been a part of uh, three recent climbing films, and I think they all worth uh, a little bit of commentary, maybe. Why don't we start with uh, this no speed record that we just saw the, the trailer for. Um, going sub two hours on the nose, that seems outrageous. Um, but help frame, from your perspective, um, in this kind of long career, you're old, this long career of climbing accomplishments, where that, where this particular record kind of situates for you? Uh, yeah, it's funny. I think uh, Alex asked me that question when we were done with the climb. He's like, is this like top five? And I was like, I don't know. It's maybe, maybe like top 10 in terms of like most fun uh, or maybe most impactful climbing experiences. I had done because generally I think of climbs that really like are a big part of my life as things that I dedicate a huge amount of training to, things that I obsess about that kind of take over a part of my life. This wasn't that. <laughs> this was something that I just kind of did because Alex wanted to. It sounded like fun. I didn't really think I would be able to pull it off. Um, but I will say the, the experience in the end, like that month long period of time that we spent trying to whittle down the time was like one of the more fun months of climbing that I've had. Did it bum Alex out when you were like, nah, man, it's not top five? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. Because okay. I don't think it was top five for him either. Okay. I think we were, you know, I, when, we, when, when we finished the climb, did, first of all, did the Real Rock film tour show in the valley? Okay, so a lot of you guys have seen the film. Okay. A lot of you have seen it? Yeah. Okay, good. Show good. of hands how many people have seen it. Okay. Oh, Lots. look at this. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, so it's not too much of a spoiler alert. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So we did it in under two hours, and it was like this mythical thing, like could the nose be climbed in under two hours? And then after we did it, Alex was like, well, if you look at the World Cup speed climbers, they climb 50 feet in like five seconds, five, under six seconds. And we were climbing at like 1 16th that pace or something like that, like way, way slower. So uh, we were like, I think it could be maybe climbed in like an hour 20. Um, <laughs> but we were both like, do we want to do that? And we we're like, to do that, it would take like life dedication. And we didn't want to do that. Um, but breaking two hours was pretty cool. Um, talk a little bit. Say just a little bit more about speed climbing, um, because this isn't something that has been a, a component of your climbing life. Um, more interesting than you thought it would be, um, what in particular did you like the most about it versus just big wall climbing? Yeah, I always thought that the race of the nose was not in the spirit of climbing that I cherished. I always thought it was like about brotherhood and about like you know real deal adventure and just like distilling it down to racing a timepiece i think that was one of the reasons i didn't want to do it for a long time um but it did turn out to be a great adventure um wait what was the question again just the element of when you add in that element of speed itself like what was i guess either the most surprising oh. thing you found or the thing that you liked most about it or yeah weren't expecting maybe yeah, I mean, I think I was I was excited by how kind of thrilling it was in the end. Like you get to the top, and um, and I think I, I think I like the idea that the first time I climbed El Cap, it took 
six days and was like this incredibly arduous process and being able to feel that progression over the years and get it from six days down to two hours like that's a very like progression is one of one of one of my favorite things in life i love that i also liked the fact that as a family man i could climb the nose and then still be down and have breakfast with my kids yeah. okay so the No Speed Record film, a number of you have seen it, and we don't know exactly when, but we're hopeful that for those who haven't seen the film, that should be coming out and be able to maybe be streamed soonish? Yeah, I'm not really sure when, but I think usually the Center Films model is they run the Real Rock Tour, which is probably still happening internationally. For, um, and then they usually um, you know, sell it to Red Bull and it shows on Red Bull TV. So at some point that'll happen. Two of the best climbing films ever came out like at pretty much exactly the same time. And of course, you happen to be involved in both of them, uh, Free Solo and The Dawn Wall. Um, so let's just start with Free Solo. Um, this obviously became a rather significant cultural moment uh, in climbing. And, and again, I mean, one of the things that I think is so interesting uh, about it is Alex gets done with his feet and was like, well, I mean, Tommy could do this too if he wanted to, right? Like, I, I remembered that actually today, um, that that, you know, that Alex said that shortly after this thing that is really remarkable, right, by every count. And he was like, well, I know a guy who could also do this if he wanted to, right? Um, I don't have a question there. I just wanted to put that statement out. But I'm curious how your take, like on that film in particular, since it came out, um, I thought your role in the film was really interesting. But in the wake of this, what are your particular thoughts about what it's either done for climbing or, I don't know, just thoughts in general about that film? Uh, I mean, I thought the film was great, first of all. like. I saw it at the premiere in Telluride and it like induced PTSD a little bit for me because I had been there during that whole experience. I was like one of the few people that was in the know that Alex was preparing and then going to climb this thing. So I was stressed the whole time. And, you know, like the days that he would go up, the time that he that he went up, you know, the first third of the mountain and then bailed. And then the time when he actually did it, like I knew that was happening in the moment. And I've watched him free solo before and I don't like it. Like I don't like watching it. And so I didn't want to be there, but I knew it was happening and it, it was just like heavy. And then the whole thing was being filmed and that added this complication. And when I watched the movie, it brought back all of those feelings. And I was like, the fact that it did that means that Jimmy Chin and Chai did a good job, you know, like there's nothing fake in that movie. It shows exactly what it felt for all of us. Um, and those guys are just really, really good filmmakers. Um, in terms of what it means for climbing, I don't know, it's, it's been really interesting for me to see climbing explode in the way it has. I, I attribute a lot of that to climbing gyms and the fact that it's going into the Olympics. But I do think that that movie Free Solo had a had a really big impact. It was so easy to understand, you know, a man climbing a mountain without a rope. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it just like, it blew it up in this kind of crazy way. And, um, and it's changed the lives of Alex and I for sure. Like both of us were like very nerdy. <laughs> uh, you know, nobody, like, I, I don't know, the history of climbing is just like these kind of geeky guys who can't really function in life. And for us to suddenly become unintentional celebrities has been, I would say, quite the adjustment for us personally. Um, but it's also kind of like validating, like this thing that we've obsessed about for so many years, like the fact that other people think that's cool um, is validating in a way. The Dawn Wall. Um... Still fair to say that this is what you would call your crowning achievement in climbing to date? Yeah. No pressure. To yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's hard to top the Don Wall for me just because it was, uh, you know, it's it sort of the perfect spot. It was all my skills brought together to do exactly the one thing in this world that I could really thrive at. Like that specific climb was catered just towards me and I dedicated, 
you know, eight years of my life almost exclusively to trying to do that climb. So it's, it's, it's really like everything else sort of pales in comparison in terms of the impact that it had on my psyche and kind of like that incredible journey that I went through to try and complete that climb. The last time we got together and talked, as I said, your book, The Push, just came out. And it's so good that kind of off record, I remember asking you back then, like, you, you, dude, you didn't really write this book, right? And I actually just asked him that again, like 20 minutes ago, because I was like, you, you didn't really write that book, right? It's like, no offense, like, you're really good at climbing. You're not supposed to be really good, a really good author, too. But he's like, no, man, I, I wrote the book. So there's that. Um, but um, I, what I'm most curious about is um, about what we're coming up on two years, two years, I think, since that book came out. Um, it is, um, it's a pretty intimate book, I think it's fair to say. It's a very personal book. And I'm just curious, um, two years later, what your thoughts are about having those stories and having a lot of those really um, personal moments um, out there in the world two years later? Yeah. Uh, man, that's a pretty complicated question. Um, so when I originally wrote the book, I think one of the reasons that it came out so personal, which is reason the reason that a lot of people connect with it, is that I didn't really write it um, with in the front of my mind trying to tell other people something. I wrote it as a personal therapy experiment for myself. I realized that I'd had all these crazy experiences in my life that I'd never really allowed myself to deeply meditate on. And so writing the book was that. Um, and I figured that by going through that process, I would discover, some, like answer a lot of questions about my life. Um, and I think a couple years, you know, having a couple years passed since the book has come out, I realized I didn't really answer any questions. I'm not sure if the book helped me heal in any way. <laughs> um, but I am very glad that I told the story just because it has inspired. I didn't try to inspire people with the story, but it has inspired a lot of people. And that is, that is gratifying and makes it feel worth it in itself. But in terms of being a personal therapy experiment, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that thinking deeply about your own experiences really helps you answer questions. It just, you know, sometimes like this blind optimism is, is, is good in certain ways. <laughs> and it also made some, it made me think more deeply about um, how I portray the people that are close to me in this world. Like I wrote a lot about my father and my ex-wife and Kevin. And I think there is things in that book that, you know, when somebody else writes a, your story, that, you know, they didn't, have, they didn't have input into what I said about them. And I think that, you know, there's probably things that stung in there. And that is something that does uh, pain me slightly. This trajectory of yours, um, we're, we're now going to make a move um, to try to somewhat quickly cover this interesting life you're stringing together. Um, you tend to downplay this a lot when I hear you talk these days about how you kind of got started in climbing and the rest, but like you kind of already were, I think phenom is not the wrong word to use when you were a teenager. And sometimes I feel like you were like, no, no, it was Chris Sharma. But like you were there, right? Like you want to disagree with that? Uh, uh yes <laughs> i suppose yeah i mean I, no I, I i i started climbing kind of younger than anybody else like and that's i'm, I'm not actually naturally that skilled Just, like got the experience kind of i had longer to gain the experience but, and that put me in a place that i feel very lucky to be in okay yeah <laughs> so whatever um <laughs> where i want to go with this is it's not like you were this underground, unknown climber for through your late teenage years, through your 20s, right? And then just recently, um, when a couple films came out, things kind of exploded for you. Like, you've kind of been in the light, the climbing light, forever, Tommy. Again, you know, you're, you've been around. Um, 
What I want to kind of get to, though, is the question of kind of bandwidth and focus. Um, and so this will be a little bit of a true and false type of question, but these days, um, as you are, you know, you have a growing role with, say, Patagonia. We'll talk about that. You are an ambassador for Protect Our Winners. You are getting more and more involved with uh, environmental advocacy. Um, you're doing all this, and then you're still finding times to go sub two on the nose. I want to hear you talk a little bit about um, what strikes me as a pretty complicated thing of, I think back in the early days, you kind of just got to be a climber and focus on that and kind of go on your missions and do that. Now you are still making history and also being a dad and a father and an activist and being pulled at, it seems like, in more and more disparate ways. So does that seem true? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Definitely. On the one hand, that seems scary to me, right? Like you haven't exactly chilled out um, on some of the objectives and the intensity of them and the focus that's required on those. So what might we be able to learn or glean about how you are still operating at a high level when being pulled in more disparate directions than ever before? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for the first almost 30 years of my life, my strength was my weakness. Like I'm the worst multitasker in the world. And what that allowed me to do is focus very, very intensely on things for a very, very long period of time. So that's how I got good at climbing. I, I, you know, I, like I said, I wasn't the most talented. I was just the one who was willing to beat my head against the wall for the longest period of time until I actually got it done. And um, that, that gave me the ability to develop this very narrow skill set, you know, completely like like I got really good at climbing on granite. It's funny when you said I was a um, a well-rounded climber in my introduction. I was like, well, I mean, I, I I'm good at big wall free climbing on El Capitan, and all three of those movies are like 200 feet from each other, or all three of those <laughs> climbs that are in those movies are like 200 feet from each other. It just so happens that El Cap became sort of the spotlight of climbing for the last you know five or six or you know ten years or whatever. And, um, but I was, like I said, I, I, I was really good at focusing and now my life is, is like challenging in different ways because I, I don't have the luxury of being able to focus on one thing um, because I have so like an abundance of amazing opportunities. So I do feel like I'm floundering a lot these days, but I'm also, there, there are so many, so many cool opportunities coming up and I'm, learning how to balance all those things um like i think for a long, like i never had to say no to anything for a long time and i've kind of had to start to figure out how to do that a little bit and i've also had to, had to figure out how to block out periods of time to feed myself like going and climbing for a month on the nose with alex that's that's my food in life you know i need that so i'll say no to absolutely everything for the month of october almost every year and and the month of like april and I'll block that for climbing, and then I'll dedicate a month towards just lobbying, doing, doing, um, you know, going to D.C. and doing that kind of stuff. And I just kind of segment it out that way. Um, and yeah, and I spend a lot you know, in the past six months. I've spent a lot of time at home for the first time in probably 20 years, just because my kids are in school and they're home, and um, that's been kind of nice in a lot of ways. So I've gotten into skiing more, and um, I don't know. I just kind of. I don't plan too much, honestly. I just kind of deal with the things that come my way as best I can and can only do so much. Yeah. As you think about other potential objectives out there, you've got to now think about like, well, would I be able to carve out enough time to do the kind of training that that would require or to spend enough time on the ground in whatever place to like get this done? I mean, is that just now maybe a new part of the calculus um, that maybe used to be less part of the calculus? 
Um, I mean, for the longest time, I was trying to become the strongest, best rock climber I could. And, you know, operating at that like 100% level was mostly what I thought about. Nowadays, I just resigned to the fact that I'm only going to be like 80% in terms of my fitness and my strength because of the time that I have. But I have so much experience that I can still pull off things like the nose. Like when I showed up for that climb, I was really injured. I was super out of shape. Um, and But because I had so much experience, I was able to just kind of get back in shape in that one month period and pull it off. And so that's a little bit more how I think about it now. I'm okay with 80%, <laughs> at least in climbing. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm challenged, but I do need that hundred percent. I, you know, I love the pain cave in a lot of ways. And so uh, I used to experience that pain cave just exclusively in climbing. Now I experience it in, um, you know, all sorts of different ways, writing and speaking and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm challenged on a daily basis in more intellectual ways. Um, let's stay on this question of strength versus experience for just a second. I mean, we've got some wildly strong and powerful climbers out there these days, younger climbers, right? And they've come up and they're, they're just training, right? They're training on plastic, they're training inside and getting real strong. And I mean, you just said, like you have found, given your experience that you, you operating at 80%, plus your experience can still get you a long way. But when you're actually on these walls, I mean, how do you, I mean, do you find yourself thinking like the nose would have been easier if you were at the height of your strength? Or are you like, nah, man, it's really about everything I've learned over the last couple of decades on this rock? Um, I mean, I think to, to do something like the nose, like to speed climb the nose, I needed a lot of experience, but I maybe it would have been better if I was more fit. Like if I would have done that climb uh, at the time that I did the Donwalk in 2015, it would have been a lot easier because um, I was like just so well versed in granite. It, we probably would have been able to do it faster. Um, I wouldn't have felt like I was just drafting off of Alex the whole time. Like that experience, you know, Alex is still in such incredible shape. And so that climb, I felt like I was just fully drafting off of him. Um, but five years earlier, maybe it, it wouldn't have been that way. Different way to put maybe the same question. If you were to go back and, well, I mean, not say to 2015, but let's go back where you're in your early 20s. Could early 20s version of you have handled, we talked a bit about like the disparate things you're involved with now. Yeah. You said you were bad at multitasking earlier, so maybe that is our answer to the question. But if, if, if it's fair to say that maybe you were physically stronger in your 20s, could, you have, could, could that version of you, 20-something Tommy, been doing everything you're doing right now? Um, probably not. I mean, I think, I think human nature is to rise to the challenge. And so who knows, I didn't really have all the array of different challenges that I have now when I was 20. So I was able to just focus on one thing, but I, you know, I was super shy. Um, the idea of getting up in front of an audience like this when I was in my early twenties was absolutely terrifying. So I had to get used to the idea of being a public figure. And um, yeah, and I probably had to get a little bit less selfish. Like having kids was pretty good in that way. <laughs> when you have, I feel like having kids broadened my horizon in a way that want, made me want a lot more than just sending the NAR. And so getting involved in environmental work or trying to learn how to understand my own story so that I could be a better teacher to others. Those are things that it, it took uh, age <laughs> to, really, to really want those, I guess. It's been a very interesting kind of evolution in watching you, um, this increased advocacy and environmental activism. Um, you know, you were not so long ago um, in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, right? Uh, on an expedition there. I feel like every time I turn around, it seems like you're in DC um, talking to uh, Congress or something. When did that 
when did you go from being a kind of locked in climber that was there to send the NAR to really start using this platform that comes when you're super good at climbing um, to have these conversations and to shine a light on some of these issues? Yeah. What's the origin story? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, like I, I said, I was sort of an un unintentional uh, public figure. I feel like activism has been the same way. I feel like I've almost been an unintentional <laughs> activist. I got invited by the Access Fund probably in 2015 or so to go to a lobbying event. And this was kind of a new idea, bringing athletes to DC to lobby in front of Congress. Like, I don't think it was really done that much before this time, but um, they invited me. It was a good friend that invited me. I didn't, I kind of didn't want to go, but I was, I was curious about, you know, that world. Not that I ever wanted to get into politics, but I just was wondering how DC worked. So I decided to go to this event. And I realized that, um, that if you show up in DC, you actually can make a difference. And I learned that if you call your representatives, you actually like all it, all it takes is, is an initiative and you can actually make a good difference. And the idea of being able to make a difference was sort of too enticing to pass up. It seemed like if I, if I learned that and then I didn't take advantage of it, I would be squandering something pretty valuable. So I started writing letters to my senators. I, and, then I got, I, and then I got invited back to DC by um, the Wilderness Society for a land and water conservation event. And then I got invited back to another Climb the Hill event the next year. And I started to make kind of friends with, the, with people like um, Senator Bennett and Marie Cantwell, because I would show up in DC and I would see them over and over again. And I started to be like, man, this is actually working. Like I show up and and uh, and they say man that one time that you showed up and you talked to senator bennett about the land and water conservation fund that moved the needle in getting that vote across the table which then protected tons of public lands i'm like wow just like one person can show up and make this difference and so um yeah i started to just kind of dive deeper and then i got educated i started writing reading books and because i was interested patagonia actually hired me um, as you know, I've been an athlete for Patagonia for a lot of years, but they're like, we want to start this new program. Essentially, we want to hire you to activate climbers specifically behind environmental issues. And so I actually became a Patagonia employee with this sort of added layer. I, I'm still supposed to do all the climbing stuff that I've done, but I now have this added layer. And so all these opportunities just kept coming up. And so, um, I didn't really see it coming, but it's, it's really taken over a lot of my life at this point. You're also a, an ambassador for Protect Our Winters. Um, and I wanted to hear you just talk about that. Um, I know you care about this a lot. And um, when did that relationship with POW come to be? And talk to us a bit about where you are. And I think there's kind of a call to action you'd like to do tonight. Right. Um, yeah, so Protect Our Winners was, you guys probably know a lot more about Protect Our Winners than I did six months ago because they've been a snow sports thing, not really into climbing. But they decided they wanted to start a branch called Pow Climb. And so um, since I was the climber that was interested in <laughs> political stuff, they called me up. And I went to a training in Denver, a Pow, a pow, a pow training, and I was really impressed by um, the tools that they were providing um, they, they you know they showed up with a climate scientist and I learned a lot from the climate scientist and um, they just seemed like they were punching way above their weight and they really did have the opportunity to um, make a difference their model seemed good to me so I decided to join um, pal climb as one of their ambassadors and yeah I think they're doing good work I think they're really doing great work so um, it's funny they're, they're they're so in the know and on top of everything I'd I had agreed to come to this event and I didn't even consider the fact that I should talk about POW at this event. And then Eliza, one of the people, one of the staff at POW called me up. He's like, you're going to Western State. You should talk about POW. And it reminded me that this, that Colorado District 3 is, is such a key, key, very, very, very key district in the upcoming elections. Um, a bu bunch of different organizations did these big studies where they tried to figure out where outdoor um, enthusiasts 
where their numbers were enough that if we could rally them to get out and vote, it could actually swing the elections, and Colorado District 3 is one of them. So that's the call to action tonight. More than most people in the country, it's really important for you guys to get out and vote if you care about the environment in the next election. Um, Maybe tying this back into climbing a bit, um, in the Dawnwall film, you, you talked about you just had this fire inside of you, you know, and I guess I'm curious if you, these days now, again, with everything that you're involved with and all these new opportunities and challenges and the rest, do you see a bit of a redirection of that fire? Um, <laughs> is this a percentage thing where half of it is now directed at some of these um, important environmental causes and you've got half an eye or the other eye on the climbing projects? Or do you just now continue to move these passions around and sort of allocate a different moment in time for both of them? How does this work for you these days? Yeah, I mean, like I said before, I kind of have to segment like months of my life towards different things. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think one, one thing that Donwall showed me is that I have a lot more capacity than I ever thought I did. And then when I, when I had kids, that also showed me that I have a lot more capacity. Like I thought I was busy when I was 20 years old and trying to climb the Don Wall. Now I know what busy really is. And in some ways I kind of enjoy it. Like I, I you know, like I, I crave just the simplicity of living out of my van and thinking about nothing but climbing. So I set aside months of my life to still do that. But I also enjoy the fact that there's really some, some purpose be, beyond just sending hard climbs <laughs> to the things I'm doing these days. Um, you know, I, I really think of the, of the future in terms of like what my kids will experience, not just what I'm going to experience or what their kids will experience. And so that makes me want to have positive impact on that. And doing that is, is very, very enticing. Like I said, it's like if I, if I wasn't going to DC, once I learned that I could make it a difference, that would, I would feel like I was, I was squandering that knowledge and that ability. And um, yeah, so I mean, like my life is hectic these days, but I'm not complaining. Like life is wonderful. I love, I love where I am. I, I feel like there's really intense purpose. I've got these two, this wonderful family. I get to go climbing in these exotic locations a couple months at a time. Like there's a lot going on there, but it's all, you know, wonderful stuff. And any problems that I have are so incredibly first world problems. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting though, to hear you talk about um, some of these other commitments and roles that you're taking on <clears throat> as being um, invigorating the climbing, not just being a distraction from the climbing, right? The, it's, a, it's a newer or different, an additional purpose and motive maybe mm -hmm. for the climbing itself. I think that's pretty interesting, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, like the trip to the Arctic was an interesting one um, because that was the first trip that I, you know, first kind of like expedition style trip that I went on that wasn't just about a climbing objective. We were there to climb a mountain, but really the main thing was to try and advocate for this place that needed protecting, that was opened up to drilling. And um, so I came away from that trip being like, that was one of the best trips I've ever been on. I think we opened it up to you guys. Um... Um, so you said that you talked a lot about uh, how a fa being a father has impacting you know just you as a climber and as a person. How do you balance that uh, difference between like wanting to send the nar and then also like passing down that stoke for uh, your kids in the next generation? Uh, I mean, I want to pass the stoke for sure, and I think that's a pretty easy thing to pass because the community of outdoor enthusiasts are just purely stoked and that's going to be addicting to almost any kid to be around like i think i've uh, like one one really interesting opportunity that climbing the dawn wall brought to me is that i've gotten to for the first time in my life be exposed to communities of people outside of the outdoor industry like i'll go and do corporate speaking gigs for like samsung or something and uh what i realized is that world sucks. Like, what we, <laughs> what we have as an outdoor community is so freaking awesome that I think 
my kids are just gonna they're gonna find that whether they you know they're, they're gonna they might not realize how good it is until you know and you know because it's just what they know but at some point they will realize if they decide to you know become you know employees of Samsung or something <laughs> and then they'll come and then they'll come back to it um, let's, but the one thing that I do think a lot about is the is the is the risk element um, like I am teaching my kids to do something that you know, in all honesty, could could potentially kill them. Like, like time, the type of climbing that I do is is risky at times, and that that gives me pause. That gives me a lot of pause. So, luckily, right now, both of them seem pretty risk adverse. Um, so, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, building off that question, a big aspect of the Don Wall in the beginning was how your father kind of dragged you up mountains when you were a kid. Do you find yourself doing the same with your kids now? Or do you see that coming in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. My dad, like, like the whole, in the same vein with the risk thing, now that I have kids, I look at, back at what my dad with, did with me, and I was like, Dad, you were insane. I can't believe <laughs> you actually did that stuff with me. But then, and I'm like, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff with my kids. But then, um, like, a year ago, my son Fitz asked me if he could do a multi-pitch climb, and I said, okay, like I never wanted to push him into it, but he asked me, so we, we went up and we did this five-pitch, um, you know, he was, he was four at the time, we did five-pitch, <laughs> like, five, five, six root, and we got, we got like three pitches up and he got really scared. It was kind of exposed and he was like yelling down to the ground to his mom and his mom's yelling up three pitches, <laughs> trying to comfort him. And, and I'm just like cradling him in my arms and I'm like, oh, I'm just like my own father. I'm such, I'm so bad. <laughs> and, then, and then we got through that kind of steep section and then, and then he kind of came back to life and he ran the last pitch to the top, which was much easier. And when we got to the top, he was so, overcome with pride for being having gotten through that that experience that he didn't stop talking about it for like months i mean he didn't he didn't actually even stop talking at all for two days <laughs> but then he still talks about it to this day and so i think that helped me to understand the the beauty of it in a lot of ways like you like my dad exposed me to pretty extreme adversity and maybe he almost killed me but he figured out a way to um, infused me with kind of like this confidence and pride that has probably fueled so much of, of my life since. And, you know, I've had such a great life. Um, so, yeah, I do. I bring my kids out there. I don't push them by any means to get out and climb, but I will, um, I will take them if they ask. And I really, really do enjoy when they want to get out and have adventures. Uh, you talked a second about this moment for your son that was very powerful and he talks about it a lot. Was there ever a moment like that for you when your dad took you out? Yeah, yeah, there was probably a, a lot of them. Um, you know, the first big wall climb that I did, I remember very distinctly. It was climbing the diamond on Long's Peak, which is still close to my home. And he took me out. I, I think I was, I was, I was, I just turned 12 and you know it's like a 2,000 foot wall so it's a pretty big route and it was this it was this kind of crazy experience because that day there was all this ice choked in this chimney at the top of the wall and the day warmed as as the day warmed up the ice started to kind of fall out of this chimney and fall all around us and these like big kind of chunks of ice like this big were kind of floating down this 2,000 foot wall and, and on a wall that big it, it's it looks like they're falling really slowly until they hit ledges close by and they, they kind of explode and you understand that this situation is, you know, kind of deadly in a lot of ways. Like if you got hit by one of those chunks, it would be, it would be really bad. And then we topped out the mountain in this crazy thunderstorm and, um, and you know, lightning was kind of striking all around and you could see my dad had kind of fear in his eyes, but he also had this incredible excitement. He's like, this is what life is all about. <laughs> and that mentality has, you know, I learned that at age 12 and that's fueled me um, ever since. Like when things get real and raw, that's my reaction to it. Like this is what li life is all about. And that's why I like to do hard things these days. Well, uh... 
when have you been the most scared on a climb? The most scared on a climb? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I mean, climbing is kind of interesting because I feel like I go into such a zone that I don't really experience fear the way that you might think unless something goes terribly wrong. Um, and probably the, like, I, I usually don't get scared in, until afterwards, until I think of what could have happened. Um, like, I don't really get adrenaline rushes. I don't, um, yeah, I don't experience extreme fear when I'm up there. Um, like there's this awareness that keeps me alive, but you know, when you say the word scared, I don't think I'd really get scared climbing, but I do remember a time, like my first time climbing El Cap, I kind of, I, I made this mistake. I'd, I'd set my haul bag on this ledge and I had climbed the, and, and my haul line was like 250 feet long or something. And my lead rope was only 150 feet long. So I climbed the last pitch to the top and I, and then I ran out of rope and it was really easy climbing. So I untied from my lead line and I climbed to the top of El Cap, just clipped into just this haul line with my haul bag, just sitting on a ledge. And as I was climbing, that haul bag fell off the ledge and like pulled me down, like within a few feet of falling over the top of El Cap. And so it was, you know, like a very close call. And that's the kind of experience that like in the moment, I just reacted. I didn't feel fear. But then once I got to the top and I was like, oh, man, I almost got yanked off the top of El Cap. That would have been real bad. <laughs> um, then, yeah, then that's when the fear kind of sets in. Um, I love that you're such a good author, but you say things like, that would have been real bad. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yep, that's fair. It's fair. Right, I'm going to kind of switch gears with this question. This is long. When you're in DC and you're getting political, like what's your approach to kind of reaching across the aisle <laughs> with issues? Um, I think storytelling is the is the way to reach across the aisle. And reaching across the aisle is is kind of hard. It's funny with 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 Protect Our Winners, I did a POW trip, uh, I did a trip with them, a lobbying trip with them, and we made an effort to bring climbers and skiers that were both Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. but showing up as a bunch of outdoor people wearing flannels. If we showed up in the office of, you know, Cory Gardner or something, he just like, or Tipton, actually, the, the, probably the main meeting that I remember um, trying to reach across the aisle was with the third district rep representatives, um, uh, Congressman Tipton. And he showed up and he, and he immediately said that he basically couldn't sign on with anything that we were thinking about because he has an R after his name. He says he's a Republican. And, you know, we had a couple Republican snowboarders and skiers there in the room with us. And they were like, wait a second. <laughs> we, we, we kind of agree, but we still want to protect our wild places. We still want to protect the environment. Like, this shouldn't be a polarizing, like, Republican versus Democrat thing. And I think that gave him pause. He didn't really know what to, what to say after that. And so, um, but when, when I go in, I tell stories about this encounter with a wolf in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And I show pictures of it, you know, and you tell pictures of like awesome climbs and all the Republicans have seen Free Solo. They love to talk about Free Solo. That climb really appealed to Republicans, actually. <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason. Um, but uh, you, do, you do find ways to connect, and you don't know for sure whether it's going to change their votes, but um, you, do actually, you do get to connect with them. And um, you know, I guess that's reaching across the aisle. Yeah, when you show up with good stories of outdoor adventures, everybody wants to hear them. Yeah. And that's why it works for athletes to, to come to DC, um, because we don't sound like traditional lobbyists and we're more fun to talk to. <laughs> We've got a question from one of our online outdoor industry MBA students for you. Uh, the question is, who do you look up, for, look up to for mentorship and inspiration, both in the climbing world and in the conservation world? Um, I mean, I've, I've been lucky to know my mentors really well um, in the climbing world, and there's been tons of them. I mean, probably my first one was uh, my, my father, but I always looked at the, the, the climbers of the golden age of, of Yosemite as the people that I wanted to kind of strive to emulate um, because they were these, um, these people that managed to sort of transcend the climbing world. Um, people like Yvonne Schnard, who had really used his, the tools, the things that he learned in Camp 4 and being a dirtbag to 
do great things for the earth, you know, and great things for the world. Um, but in terms of just climbing, yeah, it's been my peers, people like Alex Arnold as well and Chris Sharma. Um, you know, they've always taught me a lot. I think the best way to get better is to be around people that are better than you. And I've always tried to do that as much as possible with those kind of people. But in the, yeah, like in the environmental world, my, and my mentors probably first and foremost would be Yvonne. Um, Shinardi is really, um, he, does, he, he has a lot of money, but he doesn't want to have <laughs> any money. I think it was last year, Patagonia, um, they became a billion dollar company and most companies really celebrate that. He mourned it. He didn't, he, he, he like didn't, they, no, there was not one word that was said about that in Patagonia because he hates the idea of being a successful businessman. And um, I love that. I think that that's, that's really powerful. And it's what makes him really good at, at what he does. Um, but, you know, weirdly, as I've gotten into the political world, that's such this gnarly hard world that is really quite terrible in so many ways. And the people that do kind of persevere, I admire a lot. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, like the politicians that are doing good work that I've met, people like Marie Cantwell um, and uh, Michael Bennett. Um, yeah, I admire them a lot. Uh, I just want to ask the question, uh, how do you train mentally when you face a difficult, problem, uh, difficult climbing? And um, also, if, have you ever had uh, any doubt about climbing? Yeah, uh, how do I train mentally? I mean, I only know one way of training, and that's really to expose myself to like mon minorly traumatizing experiences at a like slightly increased level. Um, until, until I can endure things that at one time would have seemed majorly traumatizing. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I approach all of it. Uh, what was the second question? Oh, do I ever have doubt? Uh, yes, I mean, I've, uh, all the time. I think most climbs that I do, I think that the likelihood of, most big climbs that I do, and I'm very different than Alex Honnold in this way. Alex Honnold, he only does things that he is absolutely certain he is going to succeed at. It's good quality for a free soloist. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of the opposite. I enjoy the things that I think the likelihood of success is really, really minuscule. And so my approach is always to be like, well, I guess there's probably no chance that I'm going to really succeed at this, but I'm really excited about the adventure, so I'll just start at the bottom. And, see what happens and just enjoy the journey along the way. And so um, I guess that's doubt because when I think about it, I'm like, there's no chance I'm gonna do this. <laughs> but I like, I like the adventure. So um, yeah, maybe that's a workaround more than anything. <laughs> hey Tommy, I got a real nice question. <laughs> a couple months ago, a video came out on Instagram. I can't remember what company released it, but I held on to it for my friends that were not too big into climbing at home so that I could just shock them. And it was the video of you taking the 100, 150 foot whip on El Cap. Yeah. And the only question I ever get asked after I show them is, what, what do you think is going through his mind when he's falling? And <laughs> after watching it, I, I've probably seen it a hundred times now. It looks like you're completely calm. Yeah, <laughs> so that that fall is in the the real rock version of the of the film that we showed the trailer for, and I am calm. It's weird, like those things happen so quick. Like in the in the film, you can kind of see the the film. The footage is kind of crazy because I'm I'm climbing along, and then I just suddenly fall out of frame, and then the photographer who's across the valley with this really long lens is like, "Oh my god, he just fell! I should try and capture this." So he so he, he so he pans the camera down to try and follow me, but I'm already out of frame. So he just passes me, like he goes below me, and then he stops, and then I fall through the frame again, <laughs> and then all the way out of the frame. So in the video, it looks like an incredibly terrifying fall. But to me at the moment, I, really the only thing that was going through my head was like, ah, oh, I'm stupid, why do I do that? Like, why did I fall on 510 climbing? And so, 
Um, yeah, I, fell, I do remember falling and being like, I can't believe I'm still falling. Like, am I going to stop falling? Did, did Alex like untie from the rope? Am I going to just <laughs> fall to my death or not? And then eventually I do stop. But like I said, I don't really experience fear. As soon as I hit the end of the rope, I'm just like, duh. And then I'm like, we're still trying to break this record. I better start climbing. So I literally, I stop falling and then I just swing over and I, I start climbing immediately. Um, yeah. Did Alex get the soft catch? Did he get the soft catch? Was it a soft catch? Uh, well, he was. He wasn't. I wasn't on belay actually. I was just tied into the. He was just tied into the under, other end of the rope because we were, we were si we were simul climbing. So the reason I've it, it's kind of complicated why I fell so far, but um, essentially we're on this like traversing section of the climb. So like I had clipped this pendulum point, lowered down swung across and then was climbing and then Alex had then he had swung across and what he was supposed to do was then um, put like get back up to the rope put me on belay and then untie and pull the rope it's this really complicated thing but what he did instead was he just took me off belay for a little while and climbed with this hundred foot loop of slack just figuring that I wouldn't fall um, so that's why I fell so far <laughs> and but he didn't, he didn't, uh, what, what should have happened to him is I should have hit the rope so hard that his rope was going back like, you know, 50 feet to this pendulum point, like straight sideways from where he was at the moment. And he saw me falling and he, he just grabbed onto the rock so hard um, that he didn't get shot 50 feet sideways. So he's got some Herculean strength in his fingers. <laughs> it would have been okay if he did get shot sideways 50 feet, but... It wouldn't have been, right, would, yeah, anyways. <laughs> All right, we'll go a couple, two or three more questions here. Um, Tommy, when you're, uh, when you find yourself kind of stuck at a point, whether it be in a climb or in life in general, like you feel like you can't go any further, what do you do to push past that point? How do you dig deep and go beyond? Um, uh, usually, Usually I beat my head against the wall for a while and then I realize that doesn't work and I find a, a workaround. Like the Don Wall movie actually shows a really, really good example of this. There's this big dyno on that, on that route that I tried for years and could never do. And, um, and so I, I like built, I like rebuilt the move on my home wall and I trained for ever and I could just like never quite pull it off. And then one day I was just like, well, I just gotta like figure out another way. So I figured out this way to climb you know, like 200 feet around this eight foot section of rock. And that's kind of what I end up doing in life normally. I just like, <laughs> I just find a way around it. <laughs> yep. Um, you touched on your evolution from being a climber into this environmental activist now. And I was wondering what you might think about just this evolution of activism being connected with outdoor athletes in general. Does this can become more of the norm? Do you see like a more of a moral, moral responsibility of outdoor athletes to become more involved? Yeah, I mean, I think outdoor athletes are kind of, in some ways, they're leading the way here, partially because I think we have this more intimate relationship with nature, which allows us to see the change a little bit uh, easier than some people might. Like the fact that I go to Yosemite every single year and see the same trees and the same rock and really, really know that place really intimately. I, you know, I can remember that I used to go there and climb in um, in September, and that was the key month. And now October is even a little bit too hot. And I used to remember the there was this very dense forest between El Cap Meadow and the face of El Cap. And now half the trees died because of sort of drought induced beetle kill. And um, you know, like, and so I think we we know these things, and we're good storytellers. Um, so I think that puts outdoor athletes in this role of being able to make a, a, a pretty Im good impact. Um, oh yeah, I think it's gonna become the norm. I mean, for the most part, people who are super fit are a little bit younger. And I think as, like, I think of my own kids in this way, like Generation Z, I think it is, is what my kids are called, or generation, I forget what they label that generation, but age like four to 24. Um, like, like my wife's generation, millennials, we, they were like, we were like greenwashers. We weren't actually activists. We just like to like be seen as being activists. 
Generation Z, my kids' generations, they actually are activists because they're the ones, you know, writing their senators and going to rallies because they're the ones that actually are going to be hugely affected. You know, I like to call that same generation as like the scared as shit generation. Like their lives could be hugely affected by climate change. And so I think that that is going to bring them to life and they're going to up their game. It's already happening. You know, they really are activists. They're out there, you know, walking the walk. And I think as the threats to humanity increase more and more, the people that are out there, you know, with their with their battle axes in hand are going to increase as well. So yeah, I think it's going to become the norm. So when you did the uh, Fitz Roach verse, I recall you guys brought one sleeping bag. So I'm curious, who was Big Spoon? Who was Big Spoon? <laughs> yeah. I was the Big Spoon, always. I don't really quite understand why, but. <laughs> Goes against everything else that I know about Alex Honhold. He's such the domineering personality, but like, he likes to be the little spoon. Um, when you said that your dad would drag you to go climbing and stuff, do you think if he didn't do that, would you have explored climbing differently or at all? Ooh, that's a really, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I think if my dad wasn't a climber, I think, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think I probably would have. I think I would have gone elsewhere. Like I, I was resistant to climbing for a lot of years in my life. And um, it took me a while to figure out how wonderful it was. Like, you know, I started climbing when I was three. You know, when I climbed the diamond for the first time when I was 12, that was kind of the first experience where I was like, I'm a climber now. And it really took a lot of years of him bringing me out there to help me to realize how wonderful it, it was. You mentioned that when you were preparing to climb the nose in the sub two, you were dealing with some sort of injury. And as an athlete, I feel like that's one of the hardest mental blocks to get through when you're preparing for a big competition or to break a record. What did you do to kind of get that out of your mentality or move past that in order to accomplish this? Yeah, my answer is going to be so unhelpful. Um, so I've realized something kind of interesting with in my injuries in the past handful of years. Of like I, my the number of injuries that I've had have really upped, but I've realized that it's not because of overuse; it's because of underuse. Like I've spent my whole life using my body so much that it doesn't like to stop being used. So I had super bad tendonitis in my elbows, and I think it was a combination of holding my baby daughter and hangboarding. Those two things gave me <laughs> bad tendonitis. And so when I, uh, when I went to climb El Cap, that's what I called Alex. I was like, it's, it's really painful to climb at all. I don't think this is going to work. Um, but we'll try. So we went and we climbed El Cap the first day in Yosemite that season. And it hurt a lot. But then I woke up the next morning and I was like, huh, that's strange. It's like feels a little bit better. And so we climbed El Cap the next day. And the morning after, I was like, oh, that's weird. It feels a little bit better yet. And then we climbed El Cap three days in a row. So we climbed it, yeah, actually three days in a row, which usually would be horrible for your body. But after <laughs> that third day, I took, we could, took a couple rest days and my tendonitis was gone and it's never come back. So I think what I realized is that pumping a lot of blood through those injury areas is probably a good thing. Like it wasn't as intense, like climbing El Cap is, is weird. It's not as intense of, as like hangboarding is, um, but it does pump a lot of blood through that area and, and it hurts a little bit, but not a lot. So that's, that's kind of how I deal with injuries now. I, I do allow myself to use that injured area um, in a way that hurts a little bit, but not a lot. And because I think it needs to always be remembered that it needs, it needs to be reminded that it needs to heal. I just want to say, Thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, thank you, Tommy, for being here. This has been a real pleasure, and uh, you've given us a lot to think about. And so thank you, and everybody enjoy your evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you.